As we look at 1 Thess Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul gives us words. We're going to read starting with verse 13. We're going to land with verse 18 and let verse 18 create an emphasis for us. He says, but we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. He's talking about those who die. He says, so that you will not grieve as the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. There's a million ways to die, but there are only two ways to be raised. There's a million ways to die, but there are only two ways to be raised. You are either raised in Christ or outside of Christ. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain, we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, therefore is a powerful word. Therefore means because of everything that has just been communicated. In light of everything that I've just exhorted you with. If, and it is, all of what I have just previously stated is true, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Paul is saying that the day of the Lord and the imminent return of King Jesus, that moment, that blessed hope, that assurance that we have, it's where we've laid our anchor it's the reason that we live our life the way that we do. It's what gives us purpose in the immediate sense. We have purpose in what is immediate because we understand what is ultimate. And Paul is saying that what is ultimate should bring us comfort. That though we may experience many trials, that though there may be a pressing, though there may be fire, though there may be suffering, Though there may be persecution, though the nations may rage, Psalm 2, against the Lord and his anointed one. Why do the nations rage? I get it. It is unfathomable for us to think of a moment in time when all of the nations of the earth are going to rage against the knowledge of God and his choice of the ruler for creation, which is his son, King Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one to which has been given a kingdom that is unending and a dominion that will be everlasting. It is unfathomable for us to think about a season of life where all of the nations are going to rage. But this is what David prophesies in Psalm 2. Many believe that David wrote these, these prophetic utterances, these prophetic declarations, these prayers out of the tabernacle of David, out of the tent of 24-7 worship and prayer and praise and exhortation and adoration, the response to the beauty and the worth of God. And many people believe that being possessed by God's beauty, being overcome by God's worth, that David released many of these prophetic utterances. And he says there's coming a season where all of the nations are going to rage. Well, Mike, I just don't think that's possible. We're familiar and we've even grown comfortable in some ways. We've become desensitized. Our hearts have become calloused because we are okay with certain nations being difficult places, with certain nations being closed off, with certain nations being hostile towards believers, with certain nations actually executing people publicly that are unwilling to turn from a loving devotion and obedience to Jesus. We become okay with certain nations, but this is not what David is saying. David is saying that there's coming a time where all of the nations, there's going to be a unified effort. 
Well, Mike, you don't get it, bro. We live in America and that's never gonna happen here. You know, there's a lot of things prior to 2020 that I'd have told you would never happen here. And David is saying, the nations, there's going to be a, a joint effort there's going to be a demonic sense of unity and a conspiring against God and his purposes for the establishment of his son. But we know, and this is what Paul is saying, that the coming of the Lord is as certain as anything that has ever been real or true. And that though they mock, though they ridicule, though they accuse, though they joke, Though they slander our Jesus, there is coming a day where everything that they have said about him, they with all of the others that have ever lived, expanding over every generation, will see him. As Jesus stood before Pilate and he said, why will you not say anything in response to what they say about you? He said, don't you realize I have the power to crucify you or to let you go. And Jesus said, if my kingdom was of this world, then my servants would fight. He said, but you will see me again. <laughs> For the son of man and the sign of the son of man will appear and I will come riding upon the clouds. He's referencing Daniel's vision in chapter seven. When Daniel sees the son of man in his vision, he sees a divine human coming riding upon the clouds, approaching the Ancient of Days. And when he approaches the Ancient of Days, it says that another throne was set to the right side of the Ancient of Days, Yahweh, the Most High, the Father. And the Son of Man took his place. And he is seated right now, as Psalm 2 tells us. While the nations are raging, he says that he is seated, that he laughs. Why do the people... Why do the rulers of this age plot and make their plans in vain? Paul is letting us know that what is ultimate is what really matters. That this world has a conditioning attempt. That this world has an agenda to disciple us through the prison of the immediacy to make us feel and believe and to create an appetite as if all that actually matters is what's going on right now. But we understand that though we may have 60, 70, 80, 90, even 100 plus years, that it is but a glimpse, it is but a breath, it is a moment in the span of forever that we are going to have with Jesus. And that this is the pregame, it is the warm up. That right now we are readying our lives to be forever with Jesus. And that God has given us the time period that we have right now. You have the time that you have right now to cultivate a love for Jesus. One of the primary purposes of this age and the time that we have, your life, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 plus years, the time that you have is to cultivate a love for the Son. A love for Jesus is what you will take to the other side of death with you. A love for Jesus is what you will wake up with in eternity. A love for Jesus is what we will be rewarded by whenever we open our eyes in the place of forever, beholding the face of God and his son, the King of Kings. And so the issue of do I love Jesus is no small matter. It's no small matter. And if I were maybe in the place where we are, I wouldn't necessarily answer the question too quick as to suppose that there could not be any place in my own heart where another has eclipsed my desire for God's son. Because what I do know is that God is going to ready a bride for his son. Right now we understand that the Holy Spirit is working throughout the nations to prepare a people that will love Jesus. Ephesians 5.27 tells us that the bride will have no spot, no wrinkle, no blemish. No spot, no wrinkle, no blemish. 
Revelation 22, 17 tells us that in the last days, in those days, as we lean in closer towards the end of the age, meaning the conclusion of time, meaning this climactic moment where there will be an escalation of darkness throughout the nations as they rage against God, his purposes, and his selection of his son as the king of all creation. There will be the escalation of a demonic agenda. We understand that. Jesus communicates it clearly, even in Matthew 24. So we understand what we're leaning in towards. But as we lean in towards the end of the age, meaning the consummation of the age, the fulfillment of time, that the spirit and the bride will have a unified desire. That the spirit and the bride will say, come, Lord Jesus. That the spirit and the bride will have a longing that will be aligned. They will have a desire. There will be a passion. There will be a burning deeply on the inside. There will be a Psalm 27 4, a singular pursuit. Yes, I understand there are a lot of things that I could have, but this one thing is what my life is going to be marked by. This one thing is what my life is going to be known for. This one thing is going to create definition and it's going to inform all of the other things. This one thing I ask and this is what I will seek. I want the face of God. I want the beauty of Jesus. I want to know him and to behold him. I want to live my life consistently in his house, gazing deeply into his face. So we understand that as we are being readied in the last days, that the spirit has a very definite emphasis. And it is to prepare a bride for the son. Let me encourage you. Jesus thinks his bride is to die for. Jesus thinks his bride is to die for. And the spirit is going to ready the bride that Jesus deserves. Because he deserves a people. We understand even as we gaze into that heavenly throne room vision that gathered round the throne with creatures and angels and elders and seraphim and all the myriad and hosts that are going to be there. We understand in Revelation 5, 9 that there is a people from every tribe, from every nation, from every tongue. In Revelation 7, 9, we understand that there's a people that Jesus purchased for God with his own blood from every tribe, every nation, every tongue. We understand that Jesus laid his life down in order so that his father could have the family that he desires, a people from every tribe, every nation, every tongue. And the Spirit is working throughout the nations of the earth in order to ready this bride that the Son deserves, that the Son desires a people that will be overcome by the beauty and the worth of Jesus. A people that won't be bored with him. What are you going to do when you get to eternity and you realize that Jesus is there? (laughs) And you realize that all of our lives were supposed to be lived in preparation of cultivating a deeper, intimate love for the person of the son, right? No bride wants to arrive on her wedding day and stand there at the altar only to realize that the groom actually has no interest in who she is, but that he's there because of the benefits package. He's there because of the prospecting of income. He's there because of all of the supplemental things. The father is going to ready a people that will love his son. Hear me. And this is the people that will shake our nation. A people that have abandoned every other lover and that have fallen madly in love with Jesus are the people that God will use as the catalyst for awakening and revival in our nation. A people that love Jesus more than they love all of the American entitlements. 
A people that love Jesus more than they love their own luxury and comfort. A people that love Jesus more than they love their political affiliation. A people that love Jesus more than they love all of the hashtags and the memes and the bumper stickers. A people that love Jesus more than they love all of the movements and all of the fads and all of the trends and all of the sexy language and lingos. A people that actually love Jesus, that haven't gotten tired of Jesus, that aren't yet bored with Jesus, that want to know deeper Jesus, that actually long to worship Jesus. A people that are obsessed with Jesus. Because there's a difference. There's a difference. And we've got too many American Christians in our nation. (laughs) There's a difference between being an American Christian and being a believer that lives in America. Paul says, if any man is in Christ, that man is a new creature. He is a new creation. By being born again, you are not what you used to be. It means there's been an entire reconfiguration. You're not just a polished up version of the old you. You're not just a little bit better than you used to be. You're not still with the same kinks and issues and cycles and bumps and bruises. If that man is in Christ, then that man is a brand new version of human. Paul is saying that you are something brand new when you are in Christ. When you have given your life to Jesus, when you have been born again by the power of the Spirit, when you have pledged your allegiance, when you have laid down your life, you are no longer the same thing that you used to be. And Paul says that this category of people are now living their lives aligned with God and aligned with his purpose. And he says that they are ambassadors, that they are representatives, that they carry a word and a ministry. The word is reconciliation. The ministry is reconciliation. He says, even at times, the language, depending on your translation, can be very strong in the emphasis. He says at times, pleading with people or literally begging people, be reconciled to God because there will come a time when there is no more time. As Peter tells us, listen, beloved, don't think that God is slow as you consider slow to be. He is not slow. He's not disconnected. He has not lost interest, but he is patient. Because he has a desire that none would perish without the opportunity to repent. Jesus said, preach this gospel of the kingdom to every people group and then the end will come. Why must the gospel be preached to every people group before the end will come? Because the father understands the implications of releasing his son for him to return. When Jesus returns, there will be no more time to get right with God. When Jesus returns, he will abolish death, which means time will be no more. Death will be finally overcome. We will enter into eternity. We will face that 2 Corinthians 5 judgment seat of Christ where all of our life will be weighed according to the deeds that we did while we had time in the flesh. And he is communicating that this category of people, they are now living in alignment with God as ambassadors of his kingdom and that kingdom kingdom's purpose while they still have time to be alive. And ambassadors is a unique word. Ambassadors is a governmental word. I've been all over the world and I've had the privilege to visit different U.S. embassies. And a U.S. embassy, though it's planted in a foreign territory, is still governed according to the jurisdiction of its homeland. When you visit the U.S. Embassy, it doesn't matter what continent you're on. It doesn't matter what language they speak. It doesn't matter what the cultural sways and vibes are. Whenever you visit the U.S. Embassy, you would think that you are at home in America. 
And Paul is saying that those who have now been born again, that they are to live their lives of ambassadors, that you're to live your life as a representative, which means that I'm a representative of heaven and heaven's purposes that I'm a representative of Jesus as king and his agenda in my generation. That everything else, all of the other ways to identify, all of the other ways to create association or to create definition for my life, they've been abolished. For if any man would come, let him first deny himself, pick up his cross and follow me faithfully. As an ambassador, my life is not my own. And this is what Paul is communicating that there are a people that are going to surface in our generation that are going to abandon every other desire and attraction and fully align themselves with God and what he is doing in this moment of time. Because we should be planted in our nation like a heavenly colony. We should be planted in our nation like a heavenly colony. Heaven's embassy. But there's a difference between being a believer that lives in America with a missional perspective. I'm not here forever, and I'm not here to satisfy my own agenda. I'm not here to do what I want to do. I'm not even here to live out the American dream because the American dream is not synonymous with God's dream. And as a matter of fact, the two get very difficult to live out whenever we desire them both. But I'm not even here for the American dream but I'm here to fulfill the dream that God has in his heart. He knows that his son deserves a bride. He knows that there's only so much time before his son will return. He understands the imminent impact that the return of Jesus is going to have on the nations of the world, which is why the prophets would have said it's the great and terrible day of the Lord because it will be great for some and it will be terrible for others. Man, this urgency should hit our hearts. John tells us that we are not going to be those when we see him that are going to shrink back in shame in 1 John. Why would there be those who are going to shrink back in shame? Because at the consummation of the age, When Jesus returns riding upon the clouds, there will be no more time for you to change what is in your heart that you have towards him. There will be no more time for you to change the way that you think about him. There will be no more time for you to go back. Lord, give me another year. I got to make some things right. Give me that last decade. I didn't really live it on purpose the way that I probably should have. Lord, let me go back. There were a lot of competitors in my heart. There were a lot of other attractions like the rich young ruler at the consideration of following you fully and abandoning the treasures and the material things of this life. I just didn't see you as worth it. Lord, let me go back because there are some things that I have in my heart that I'm ashamed of. There's some things that I have in my heart that I'm not really proud of. There's some ways that I feel about you and things that I think about you that I wish I could change, but here I am and there you are and oh my God, now what am I going to do about all of that? John says that there will be some who when they see him, Shame fills their heart. And I lived my whole life wrestling with you and fighting you. I lived my whole life trying to do it my way and trying to do my own thing. I lived my whole life. Me, me, me. I, I, I. In a Richard Wormbrandt message, for those who don't know who he is, he lived in communist times in Russia He was imprisoned beneath the earth. He suffered greatly for Jesus. He wrote the book, Tortured for Christ. In a message that he preached, he said, why in the English language is the I the only letter that when it is left all by itself stands capitalized? (laughs) 
Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. There is a purpose that is bigger than you. There is a call that is more important than your preference. There is a dream that is wild enough and valuable enough that it demands the entirety of our life. Man, what could be a dream so wild that would be worthy of laying down your life? I grew up a military kid, and so I was surrounded by people who found a cause that was worthy to lay down their life. They thought that the preservation of this nation and the protecting of these borders was of the utmost importance. And they found so much value in it. My dad was in the Air Force for almost 25 years. We spent time all over the world. I was actually born here in Florida, Eglin Air Force Base. But I spent time around people that were passionate. It was more than a commitment. It was beyond the place of just weighing all of the options and then saying that, man, this is cool until fire really hits this thing. And then I've got some other options because I'm only in it as long as it's enjoyable. Right? This wasn't the category of people that I was surrounded by whenever I was growing up. But these were a people that put it all on the line. These were a people that were willing to leave time and time again, not having the reassurance that they would actually return. These were people that kissed their families, their children, their loved ones before they left, not knowing if they would see them again. But they understood that there was a purpose that was greater than their own immediate satisfaction. They understood that there was a call that was worth giving their life for if it called for it. What could be a dream so wild and so valuable that would actually demand that you give your whole life to it? I think to answer the question, we would have to look into the face of Jesus. Because there was a dream that filled the father's heart that he saw as worthy enough of a conclusion, worthy enough of an outcome, worthy and valuable enough of an objective that he was willing, no man takes my life from me. Jesus was not a man that was just murdered. He was surrendered before he was murdered. They did not take his life from him. He laid it down. And for the joy set before him, he willingly endured the cross, embracing it and scorning all of its shame and all of the ridicule. He was not a man that was just publicly executed because it did not actually fall in line with the purpose that he was longing to see accomplished. For if the rulers of the age had known what they were actually doing, 1 Corinthians 2, 6 to 8, what they were doing when they nailed Jesus to that cross, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. But there was a dream that filled his heart that was so real, it was so valuable, that he said, I will give my own life if it means that we can secure having what we want at the end. Beloved, let me tell you this. At the end, God is going to have what he wants. At the end, what God wants, God is going to have. And there is no devil, there is no agenda from hell itself that can defeat all of God's purposes, the plan, what he has set into motion, the victory that he worked in Christ on the cross. There is no weapon, no scheme, no wile of the wicked one that can derail God's agenda. And the dream that God had in his heart that was worth laying his own life down was a family. Revelation 21, three and four tells us that at the end, God will come. And it will be said in those days that he has abolished death forever, that he will wipe every teary eye dry. Blessed are those who mourn. <laughs> he will wipe 
every teary eye dry. And he will right every wrong. And it will be said in those days that God abides in the midst of his people forever. Paul is telling us in 1 Thessalonians 4, in the verses that we read, that these words should bring comfort to our hearts. That these words should bring a sense of purpose for the days that we're living in. We need what's ultimate to inform what's immediate. We need the things that are ultimate to inspire our agenda for what is immediate. We need the things that God says are ultimate to be what infuses us with power, what gives energy to, what sets fire in our hearts. The things that are ultimate need to move us deeply and securely in the time period that we know to be right now, which is the immediate. But too many times our lives in what is immediate is given over to so many other things, even if they are not directly connected to what it is that God has said is ultimate. Because there will come a moment where we realize how many of our efforts were in vain. There will come a time where we will clearly understand all of the idols that we formed in our hearts. All of the things that we fashioned out of our own ambition, out of our own demand for a certain way of life, for a certain lifestyle, for a certain income structure, for a certain this or that. There will come a time where we realize how much of it was actually hollow. How much of it was actually unto us. Even though we may have slapped a Jesus bumper sticker on it. But the book of Acts, as Pastor Gary said, clearly communicates to us because the book of Acts is not just history, it is also prophecy. And the book of Acts prophesies to us that at the end of the age, with wicked governmental structures, with the tyranny and the oppression of the powers of the air and the rulers of the age, that while believers are being chased down, jailed and executed out in the streets, that there is going to be a people that are madly in love with Jesus. That there is going to be a people that populate the darkest time period that the world has ever known, that are obsessed with the Son of God, that there is going to be a people that are on fire with the message and the mission of the gospel. There's going to be a people that look directly and deeply into the face of all of the consequences of considering the cost of loving Jesus in a public way. There's going to be a people that look into the face of those consequences and determine that he is worth it. And their lives are going to be accompanied by signs, wonders, miracles, glory, fire, the power of the Spirit, a prophetic utterance, unction, declaration, a synergy with God himself, a moving throughout the cities and the nations, a revival and awakening hitting every continent, wild out in the streets. There will be a people that love God's son. And I believe that the call of the hour is will you love him? I believe the call of the hour is will you love him the way that he deserves to be loved? American Christianity tells us we can love him our own way and demand that he accept it because it's about I and me first. We're a culture of power and platform, prestige, politics, finances, the Hollywood culture, the music industry vibe. All of the current system of the world, all of the influence of this age and its ways that 1 John tells us in 2, 15 and 16, do not love the world or its ways. For this current age and everything associated with the system of the world is going to pass. 
the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Do not have these things in you, beloved, because if so, then the love of the Father is not actually alive on the inside. The love of God in us should be conquering self-love. The love of God in us should be conquering the love of the world. And the call in this hour, because let me just encourage you, you cannot just love him your own way and demand that he accept it. Jesus has the right to define the way that he feels loved best. I get it, Gary Chapman wrote an amazing book. The Five Love Languages, phenomenal. But Jesus has a love language too. He's a real person. He's a man that's alive on the other side of death. He's the firstborn from the dead, as Colossians would tell us, so that he could have preeminence in all things. Unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it will not be able to multiply or to harvest itself. We understand that Jesus is the seed, that he is the one who went into the soil of the earth and even under the earth, that he is the one that has conquered the grave. He's conquered hell. He's conquered the accusation of the enemy and he is alive. He's been raised up. He is resurrected. He is glorified. He is ascended. He is enthroned and he has a way that he feels loved best. And in John 14, he says, those who love me are those who obey me. And as a matter of fact, just so that we can understand that the flip side of that, he says, and those who don't obey me, they're the ones that actually don't love me. Jesus' love language, or one of the ways that we can love him and love him well, is to love him with our yes. Well, Mike, I don't, I don't really understand what yes, any yes. Well, which yes am I supposed to give him? Anyone that he asks for. Anyone that he asks for. He's worthy of every yes. He's worthy of any yes. He's worthy because he's worthy. He's more worthy than any other. As the Song of Solomon says, he's the chiefest among 10,000. The chiefest what? He's the best. He eclipses them all. 10,000 what? 10,000 anything. You put him next to 10,000 anything. And my Jesus is better than that. And he feels loved by our yes. But will you love him with your yes? Or are there yeses that you've reserved for yourself? Are there spaces and places and compartments where you've determined that it's Jesus and? Well, I need Jesus and I need a little bit of this too. I need Jesus and I need my life to look like this. I need Jesus and this amount of income. Jesus and this circle of relationships. Jesus and, Jesus and. It's not Jesus and, it's Jesus only. And as long as there's Jesus and, there's competition. As long as there's Jesus and, there's other lovers. As long as it's Jesus and, the sole worth of Jesus in our hearts is being eclipsed by other attractions that are being created from other appetites that have not yet been crucified the way that God desires for them to be. For Paul says that there is a category of people in Philippians 3 whose God is their appetite. Philippians 3, 18 and 19. What are you hungry for tonight? What are you hungry for tonight? Leonard Ravenhill would say, you let me live with a man long enough, I'll tell you what he really wants. You let me live with a man long enough, I'll tell you what he really believes. You don't have to communicate to me what you're about, what you're on fire for. You just let me get around you long enough and I'll tell you what's actually happening. Let me just get around you long enough and I'll tell you how you actually feel. There's a people that are rising 
in this hour of history. And they're wild. They're wild because they're free. They're powerful. They're powerful because they're free. They're free from the oppression of the age. They're free from the powers of the air. They're free from the system of the world. They're free from all of the discipleship agenda that the world is trying to drive deeply into our hearts. They're free. They're free. They're free. Are you willing tonight to give your life fully to Jesus and his agenda? Are you willing tonight to give your life to the mission that God is on right now? Because God is on a mission. Are you willing to abandon every other lover that this life has to offer in the consideration of the beauty and the worth of Jesus? Are you willing to allow God to employ you as an ambassador in this generation? Are you willing to live on fire as a representative of heaven's agenda? Are you willing to let God touch you in a way that is real enough, it's authentic, it's powerful? Are you willing to let God touch you so that he can send you? Because in many instances, we're trying to turn people People into leaders that aren't yet first lovers. Man, anybody who's ever been involved in church life, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Man, just find me somebody that's willing. Find me somebody that's going to be on time every time. Find me somebody that's just going to stay off the front page of the paper. Find me somebody that's just going to know how to do what it is that we're asking them to do. We're trying to turn people into leaders that aren't even yet lovers. We're expecting them to be laborers, but they're not even yet lovers. <laughs> but I believe that God takes lovers and turns them into laborers. Because if you're not a lover, there's a place in your labor where when it's intersected with the consequences, you will turn your own way. For the eye in your own preference, the eye in your own desire has actually never been conquered the way that Paul said in Galatians 2, for it's no longer I that live. The eye is no longer even an issue. For the world has been crucified to me and I to it. The eye has been abolished. The eye has been laid down. But I realize now that my life is about one purpose. I understand now that my life has one primary agenda and everything else is going to fall subject to that mission. I understand now that there's something that God is doing because he accomplished it in me. And what he's doing, he did it in me, and it's real. And now he's using me in order to accomplish that mission, spanning across the nations of the earth until he sends his son again. And I understand now that the eye is not something that is in the way. For the world has been crucified to me, and I to it. But too many times we're living for the things of the world. Too many times we are overcome with other lovers. Hear me. God is raising up a people that will love his son the way that he deserves. He is raising up a people that will love Jesus with everything. That will look into the face of Jesus and say, I believe with all of my heart that you are worth it. You're worth it. And I will give anything. I will give everything. I will go anywhere while there is still time to do so. I will live on purpose. I will live apprehended by your mission. 
even in routine places. I will return to what seems to be routine and I will be present on purpose. Every place that I go, even if I don't have anywhere to go, I will go the places that I normally go and I will go where I normally go and I will be there on purpose. I will be there on mission. I will be there on fire because I understand I understand that there's not much time left. Listen, I'm not battling you theologically. These don't have to be the last days for all of creation. But what I do promise you is that these are our last days. They don't have to be the last days for all of creation as we know it until the great reconciliation happens. But I do promise you this. These are our last days and there is one thing that God will not take from you he's all powerful he's fiery he's righteous but he's tender and he's kind and he's meek and he's broken and there's one thing that he will not take from you he will not take your yes from you. He will not force you to give it. There is something that you can do that God cannot do. And that is offer your yes to him. Only you can give God your yes. Only you can look at him and say, yes, I will live my life for you. Only you, only you, the person sitting next to you can't give their yes for you. Your pastor can't give the yes for you. Those that surround you, those who have the best loving intentions for you, those who are jealously right now praying for you and have been committed to do so for long periods of time, they cannot offer that yes for you. Only you can look at Jesus and give him the yes that he wants. I'm gonna ask you to stand up on your feet all over the room. It was a yes to Jesus that radically changed my life. I said that in the beginning. I was a drug addict for more than a decade, an alcoholic for longer than that. By the age of 21, I had been in and out of jail 15 times. Gang life, drug dealing, troublemaker, violent, filled with rage and hatred. I was a broken, dark individual. I'm not proud of the things that I did or the life that I lived or the accumulation of all of what was a whole bunch of nonsense. But I lived my life pursuing myself. I lived my life longing to satisfy the eye that was very much alive on the inside. And I walked into a church two weeks after my 21st birthday. Man, 21 years old and my life was already that much of a mess. 17 years old sat in a doctor's office because I woke up one morning with some problems. I went to the bathroom and quickly realized that there was issues I never had before. There was a manifestation. Some would call it an outbreak. That's what the doctor said it was. That afternoon, after taking blood tests and being examined by medical professionals, I found out the later results just confirmed what they already knew to be real. I found out that afternoon while sitting in a doctor's office, I had a man who had been in medical practice for decades look across the desk at me and say, young man, because of the decisions of your life and the way that you've chosen to live it, there's now something that is going to mark your story forever. These are the words I was told. 
there's now something that is going to mark your story forever. This will be with you forever. Because of the way that you've chosen to live your life, there's now a disease in your bloodstream. Because of the way that you've chosen to live your life, you've now contracted a sexually transmitted disease. Because of the way that you've chosen to live your life, you now have herpes. He said, if you're ever going to one day have a spouse and be intimate with that spouse, there is a 100% chance that you are going to transfer the disease by way of intimacy to your spouse. He said, young man, you're never gonna be able to have children that are not going to be, as I was told that day, tainted by your life's decisions. He said, this will be a part of your family story forever. He said, because of the way that you've chosen to satisfy yourself, this is now the condition of your life. To a 17 year old, this was devastating. You would think that at this point, this would have been the flip of the switch where the lights would have come on and somebody would have said, hey, listen, stupid, you're ruining your life. Hey, listen, things are not going as well as you think they are. Hey, listen, you are ruining any hope of a future, of a promise, of a destiny, but it didn't. It actually pushed me into a darker, more aggressive down spiral of darkness. It actually buried me in anxiety and suicidal tendencies and attempted overdoses and on and on. So I walked into a church two weeks after my 21st birthday. As a matter of fact, it was October 6, 2002. It was Pastor Appreciation Day. It was a Sunday night service in Central Florida. They were gonna honor his family after the gathering in the fellowship hall, which was right next door. And I was there to fight the pastor's son, praise God. Oh, this is real life. And I stood outside the church doors with a backpack full of drugs, a small bag full of product. At the time I was a small business owner. I was running a street pharmacy, like I mentioned. And I stood outside the church doors attempting to fight the pastor's son of like an eight, 900 person church. Assemblies of God Church, not that far from here. But I ended up in the service because the pastor's son told me it'd be better to fight after church than beforehand. Hey, listen now, I was committed to the mission. I'm here for it, bro. Whether we throw down beforehand, whether we get it on afterwards, like just know I'm committed. Like I'm about that life. Like I'm here. And me and two friends made the mistake of going inside. And we went inside and we sat in the back row. I put my backpack full of drugs next to me and we waited for the clock to run out because I thought that I had plans for after service. <laughs> and that night I ended up at the altar, not because I wanted to be there. Somebody asked me if they could pray for me. As a matter of fact, this place was a circus. I had never seen anything like it. It was full-blown spirit, charismania, signs, wonders. Man, they were rallied around the altar, jumping and hollering and crying and laying on the ground. And I mean, they were singing a song that was set me on fire, that Lyndall Cooley Brownsville song. And man, I, I had never seen anything. I thought I had seen crazy stuff in the streets. I was familiar with crazy. Right, like, like hood kind of crazy, like streets kind of crazy. But these people were kind of crazy I had never seen. And I got invited to the altar and they asked me if I would pray a prayer. And let me just be honest with you. I didn't even believe, I didn't care. In my mind, this place was a circus. I didn't even think anything was gonna happen. I thought to myself, let me do whatever I have to do to satisfy the desires of the moment and the environment because what I really wanna do is get out of this awkward place, fight somebody in the parking lot, get back to Tampa so that I can do the things that I really actually wanna do. And so if you're asking me to pray, I'll pray because nothing is actually going to happen when I pray. And I raised my hands and I closed my eyes. And then it happened. 
I came into a visionary encounter where I was no longer standing in the altar that I was in. It was as real as anything that's ever happened to me in my whole life. And in the distance, I saw him. And I immediately knew who he was. He was Jesus. I didn't have to ask any questions. There was no second guessing. I didn't even believe that he was real. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't even believe that he was real. But when I saw him, I knew exactly who he was. I knew that he was the son of God. I knew that he had prayed, paid the price for the sins of the world and not just of the world, but for me personally. And in the distance, his face turned towards me. And when he saw me, he lit up. He was illuminated. He is the radiant expression of God. And excitement filled his face. And he began running in my direction. And when he ran up to me, he grabbed me and he held me close. And he began speaking things over my life. Some of you need to hear this. He said, you're not a mistake. You're not an accident. No matter what they've said about you, I've said yes to you. I formed you. I knew you before I knit you together and put you in your mother's womb. I have a plan for you. I have a purpose for you. There's something that I long to see accomplished in your life. I didn't even know that these things were in the Bible. I had never read it before. I later found out, obviously, that they're in the Bible. But he is the word, so he can't deny himself. And I came out of that one experience with Jesus. Listen to me, one experience with Jesus. And I was a radically different person. I was a new creation. I had become born again. If that man be in Christ, then that man is a new creature. Old things have passed. All things have become new. Say it with me. All things have become new. Not just the things you are comfortable with. Not just the places where you believe God can work. Not just the difference between the things that you believe are possible and what you still believe is impossible. There is no thing that is too hard for the Lord. That night, out of one encounter, delivered from drug addiction, alcoholism, rage, violence, perversion, lust, brokenness, suicidal tendencies, all of these things broken off of my life through one, one encounter with Jesus. One encounter with Jesus. There was one step, come to Jesus. One step, come to Jesus. Now, I had to learn how to live that stuff out. Too many times we forfeit deliverance because we don't know how to live delivered. <laughs> we'll leave that there. We don't know how to set our life up to continually live delivered, and so we forfeit deliverance. We think to ourselves, well, maybe he didn't really do it. Well, maybe it wasn't as real as I thought it was. We have to learn how to walk out the things that God works in just to make it amazing a few months later I was at that same altar and they laid hands on me and it felt like somebody dumped a hot bucket of water on my head and it ran down over my body we're going to pray for miracles in just a moment we're going to pray for the power of God to come down crashing upon your life and it felt like a hot bucket of water got dumped on my head and ran down over my body and I hit the floor I went down now listen I'm not going down as some courtesy fall right I'm not going down because I'm getting pushed either 
I'm not going down because whoever's praying for me, their breath is, I just can't deal with it. And so I'm trying to get away. And the easiest way to get away is just to kind of like retreat backwards. No, no, no. And I'm def- I'm not getting down just because everybody else is falling down. Right? Like we know what I'm talking about. You fall, right? And then you open your eye and you look around. You kind of get comfortable, right? You call for the blanket guy so that they can cover you up so that you can kind of fix yourself and get together for a little. No, 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 no. I'm not going down for any of that. And I went down and my going down changed my coming up. And I went home and reached into my drawer where my bottle of pills were. Because again, there's no cure. There's no cure for herpes. Science still to this day, medical practice still to this day has not come up with a solution in order to rid it from your system. Some of you have been told that you're in an impossible situation. Some of you have been told by professionals. Some of you have been told through the face of loved ones and those who seem to have your best interest that you are between a rock and a hard place and that unless God comes through for you that nothing is ever going to change for you that your situation is impossible what you're dealing with is always going to be the same whatever's happening to you is always going to be what's happening to you and you've actually identified with your issue the woman with the issue of blood her identity is her issue And I heard a voice as I was extending my arm into my drawer and it said, Mike, you don't need those anymore. And now science doesn't understand why what was in my blood report, what was with me and was supposed to be a forever part of my story what they said there was no hope for, what they told me there was no cure for, what they told me I was going to have to be on medication for, for the rest of my life or until the point when the sickness took my life. They don't understand why for six years their reports said that it was there, but now my blood report says that it's no longer anywhere to be found. blood of Jesus gave me an answer that science does not have. The blood of Jesus gave me an answer that the medical profession has not found. The blood of Jesus raised me up when I was down and in the pit. The blood of Jesus raised me by his love when they said I was down for the count. And I believe that the blood of Jesus is going to raise some of us here tonight in this room. Are you willing to give God your life tonight? I'm not asking you, are you willing to attend meetings? I'm not asking you, are you willing to go on a missions trip? I'm not asking you, are you willing to pray before your meals? I'm asking you, are you willing to give your whole life and your whole yes to Jesus tonight? Are you willing to no longer live your life for yourself, but to lay it down tonight? And from this moment forward, man, let a line be drawn in the sand. Whatever it was, it was. Whatever it used to be, it used to be. However I used to do things is however I used to do things. But man, I'm telling you, something happened in my heart tonight. Man, I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost touched me and I felt like there was a new fire and desire in my heart tonight. And I want that from this moment forward, there to be a threshold there to be a line, there to be a drawing in the sand. And tonight, I'm crossing over. I'm giving him everything. Tonight, I'm crossing over. I'm giving him the yes that I know that he wants. I'm no longer running while just padding my life with all of the external stuff. I'm no longer internally running and then just trying to publicly, externally satisfy all of that by keeping the right image alive. Tonight, I want the inside to be lined up with the outside. Tonight, I want to give it all to Jesus. 
Tonight, I want to lay my life down for God. Tonight, I want to be about my Father's business. Tonight, I want to know that my life is a part of God's mission. Tonight, I want to know that while there's still time, that I'm going to be about what God is trying to be about. And whatever the cost, let the consequences come. Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. I want to ask you all over the room tonight to answer the most important question that anybody's ever asked you. Peter says that God is not distant and disinterested. He says he's patient because he desires that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save after that one which is lost. The issue of the gospel is not whether you are a good person or a bad person. The issue of the gospel is whether you are dead or alive. The issue of the gospel is there was one time when we were all dead in our sins and trespasses, but praise God by his own tender loving mercy his desire and his grace towards us bestowed upon us through the precious blood of his son and the wisdom of his cross praise God that he has made us alive to himself and we can now live in union with his son by the power of his spirit I'm not asking you are you good or bad you can be a good person and be a dead person. You don't have to be an adulterer. You don't have to be a murderer. You don't have to be trafficking. You don't have to have ever beat your wife or your kids. You don't have to have ever robbed a bank. You don't have to be an addict. You don't have to be someone who is dishonest on your job. The issue is not, are you good or bad? The issue is, have you come alive to God? through the laying down of your own life, repenting of your own way, and fully giving yourself to Jesus. Tonight, the most important question that someone has ever asked you, it will determine what is ultimate. And what is ultimate should be the most important thing to us according to the way we live our life by what is immediate. Have you given your life to Jesus? I'm not going to make it difficult here in a moment. Have you given your life to Jesus? This is something that is between you and him. Have you given your life to Jesus? Tonight, if you know that you have not said yes to that call, that you have not said yes to the heart cry of God, then like Paul, I am begging you, be reconciled to God. I am imploring you, say yes to Jesus. You are never guaranteed another opportunity to say yes to Jesus. For we don't know what tomorrow will be. And so I'm going to ask you all over the room right now, close your eyes with me for just a moment. Right now, if you know that God is speaking to you, if you know that God is tugging on your heart, you know that you've been living for yourself in your own way. But tonight, you would say, I want to give it all to him. I don't know what that even really means, and I don't even know where it goes. But tonight, I know that I at least want to answer that call. Because I feel him knocking upon my heart. I feel him knocking upon my heart. Open your eyes with me.
because he did what he did for us in public. He did what he did for us in public. And so I'm gonna ask you to do it too because he's worth it. Tonight, if you wanna give your life to Jesus, I just want you to throw your hand up in the air for me. Right now, right where you're standing. Tonight, you're saying, I wanna give my life to Jesus. Just throw your hand up in the air for me. Come on, we're gonna pray in just a moment and I want you to be included in that prayer. So right now, if you wanna answer that call, that tug upon your heart, come on, just keep your hand lifted for me. Come on, don't put it back down, just keep your hand lifted. Tonight, I'm gonna give my life to Jesus. Come on, yeah, I see young people. I'm not gonna say I see older people because I just, I don't wanna say that. I know what I mean, just older than me. That's, if you're older than me, that's older. I see younger people, I'm gonna say it, I see older people. And I don't want to give my life to Jesus. I'm going to ask you for one more moment before I pray. If you want to answer the knocking on the door of your heart right now, lift your hand. I want to give him my life. If you have not raised your hand yet, raise it now. I want to give him my life. And tonight I'm going to do that. You can have my yes. All over the room, Lord. You see every hand lifted. You know every story. I pray, King Jesus, right now, from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet, would you wash them in the precious blood of the Lamb? Would you take the filthy rags, all of our garments that over time have become red as crimson? And would you make them white as snow? Would you do what no man can do? Would you do what no amount of money can do? Would you do what no other strategy can do? Would you do what no other effort can accomplish? Right now, I'm asking you for those with hands lifted, hunger in their hearts, would you bring them into Jesus? And that man, that woman that is now in Christ, would you make them a new creature? Would you make them a new creation? I pray, Holy Ghost, for a born again experience for the power of God. Make them brand new. Old things pass. All things become new. And I pray, I pray, align them with you and your agenda. Life no longer for themselves, but from this day forward, by the grace and the power of the Spirit, all for Jesus, all for Jesus. Take the world, but give me Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in their hearts. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in their hearts. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in their heart right now. Come on, if you prayed that prayer tonight and you said yes and gave your life to Jesus, welcome to the family. And not only welcome to the family, but welcome to the mission. Welcome to the mission. If you prayed that prayer, I believe there's a number on our, oh, it's actually right here. There's a number. I want you to text that number because there's a people that wanna connect with you, a family that wants to connect with you and love you and walk with you. We need this. You cannot walk it out successfully on your own. We need family. We need the church. 
We need to be a part of a body, of a people that are going to walk with us. Text that number. Text that number. I pray, text that number to get connected to God's house, His family, and His mission. Text that number. And right now I wanna ask you, if there's any of you, I didn't tell my story so that you could say, oh wow, look at you. But I told my story because I know that God's no respecter of person. I told my story because I know that what He's done for me, He's not just able to do for you, He's willing. Too many times we know that he's able, but there's a disconnect in my heart that I don't believe that he's willing. Tonight I know that he's not just able, but that he's willing. And tonight I wanna pray for impossibility to bow its knee to Jesus. I wanna pray for the power of God and the demonstration of that in your life to accomplish God's desires, to destroy sickness, to overcome infirmity, to conquer disease, to destroy addiction, to demolish bondage. If there's anything that you know as you're standing right now in your life that has seemed impossible, what the doctor's report has said, the numbers and the stats have testified to you, your own experience and the cycles of things that you've been perpetually going through, whatever it may be, I want you to turn away from what every other has said and turn to Jesus and believe what it is that he has said and he has said that when we lay our hands on those that are not well that God will raise them up that God will make them well that God will heal them and tonight we're gonna do just that we're gonna believe for miracles tonight we're gonna believe for miracles tonight if you've got sickness in your body we want to lay hands on you Tonight, if you came in with, with a bondage, with an addiction, you know there's an appetite on the inside that hasn't been conquered yet. Right? We know it's demonic in nature because it makes us crave something other than Jesus. If you came in tonight with an addiction and you long to see it broken, we want to lay hands on you. And I believe that the power of God is going to break the chains off your life tonight. And that that's not going to be your story. That you're not going to be that guy with that problem. You're not going to be that woman with that addiction. You're not going to be, oh, you know, sister so-and-so that has cancer. But tonight, by his stripes, we are healed. By his stripes, we are healed. So I'm going to ask you tonight, if there's sickness in your body or an addiction that you want to see broken, this is what we're going to do. Our team, the prayer team, the pastoral team, man, I believe that they're, these are torches. They've got fire on their life. That there's anointing and glory and real oil that they carry. So we're going to come around and we're going to lay hands on you. We're going to believe God tonight for impossibility to bow its knee. And so I'm going to ask you tonight, if you want to see something conquered in your life, sickness, addiction, brokenness, I'm going to ask you to step to the aisle, wherever you may be. I'm not going to bring everybody to the front. I'm just going to ask you to step to the aisle right there where you are. Just step out into the aisle. Step out into the aisle. In just a moment, we're gonna come down and we're gonna come around and we're gonna begin to lay hands. And we're gonna believe God together tonight that the testimony of the Lord is gonna be raised up. That the testimony of the Lord in your life is going to be demonstrated for the glory 
of Jesus. Come on, tonight, if you're sick in your body, or if you're looking for deliverance from addiction, step out into the aisle. Come on, if you're wrestling, I'm going to give you just another moment to wrestle. I'm going to give you just another moment to wrestle. Step out into the aisle. Our team is going to begin to lead in worship. We're just going to begin to come around. Hey, but I promise you this. What's important is not that a man lays his hand on you. What's important is that God lays his hand on you.